Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and Star Wars The Clone Wars final season gave even greater depth to the heartbreak of Revenge of the Sith, with animated faces somehow seeming more human than real ones. Now that season 7 has ended, I'm gonna go back through each episode for all the interesting Star Wars easter eggs, timeline updates, and the missable details that really made the prequels better. How do we do this for the sequel trilogy? I'm kidding, I would never want to turn back time on being able to do a video called Palpatine. The whole Clone Wars series is about the relationship between Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka. Ahsoka Tano. Ahsoka is a friend whose journey truly motivates Anakin to part with the Jedi. A motivation deeper than love or mommy issues. Motivation based on defiant individualism. The first four episodes of the Bad Batch arc, reanimated versions of the story reels released in 2015. Experimental unit Clone Force 99. The defective clones with the uh, desirable mutations. 99, eh? Huh. Nice touch. Their name, 99, is a nod to the beloved janitor, Clone 99, who heroically died during a past season attack on Kamino. The whole idea is to humanize the clone troopers to make their betrayal of the Jedi under Order 66 emotionally devastating. This batch includes Hunter, Tech, Crosshair, and Wrecker. Hunter's helmet looks like an early prototype for the later Imperial Stormtrooper helmet. On their ship is a poster translating to Clone History Month, Geonosis, showing respect for the first wave of clone troopers who fought on Geonosis. There are Arabesh signs and posters everywhere. I'll just kind of review the more interesting ones. This first episode also shows Firenox lurking in the background. Those are the sunlight avoiding predators that also show up in Rebels. And the batch sneaks up on a couple droids. You know what's going on? Maybe it's another dream. This is actually the same Stormtrooper banter in A New Hope on the Death Star. You know what's going on? Maybe it's another drill. Episode 2 added a new scene with Padme visibly prego. Even though this would be set before she reveals to Anakin in Revenge of the Sith that she's pregnant, Padme is wearing a similar outfit that she wears later on Mustafar, so it seems like the idea is to remind us of this coming breakup and make us feel feels. But more importantly, we learned that Obi-Wan knew about this affair. I hope you at least told Padme I said hello. So this recontextualizes their affair to be more of a poorly kept secret, which makes Obi-Wan less naive and a truer friend to Anakin for not writing him out. They did remove the story reel bit with the sexy Padme art on the side of their ship, but that art does show up in the background of Rebels. They got it in! On this mission, they rescue Echo, long thought to be dead since season three, but actually plugged into a separatist computer to counter the clone's movements. Echo's trauma and pale part cybernetic body give Anakin a look at his own future, a dark destiny hinted at by the final exchange between Echo and Rex. Yeah, just like old times. In this episode, Tex goggles scroll through some Orabesh translating to Star Wars creatures we've met before. Bonzami, Nexu, Toydarian, Peko Peko, Pergil, Nibre, and Wampa. And Anakin takes down the Separatist droid the same way he destroys the droid right before he meets Ahsoka in the movie. One of the many echoes linking these two, even though we don't see them together in most of these episodes. This arc ends with Anakin's dark step toward destiny, killing Admiral Trench, this time for real. You're a Jedi. You're no I don't have such weaknesses. Now you'll notice the Imperial March played a bit there, and when he kills Trench, the Emperor's theme plays. Okay, onto the Martez arc. Uh -uh. Included to show how common folk actually hate the Jedi, helping justify society turning on them after Order 66. After leaving the Jedi, Ahsoka meets Trace and Rafa Martez in the lower levels of Coruscant. You happen to crash onto one of the best repair shops on 1313. 1313 is a nod to this setting being inspired by the canceled Boba Fett video game, 1313. Ahsoka knocks the radar dish off a cruiser, a nod to the running gag with the Millennium Falcon, and throughout the background of this arc are sightings of the races of the occupants of the Mos Eisley Cantina in A New Hope. Many of these sightings dressed in their rare original action figure clothes. Rodian, Ithorian, Bith, Twi'lek. Aqualish, it's a race upon the Baba. Some loaf cats also appear, originally from the animated series, but a live action version showed up in The Mandalorian. A sign in the laundromat translates to Calrissian soap. Rafa has some gambling debts, suggesting that she might have already crossed paths with, or one day might, well-known gambler Lando Calrissian. In this episode, they fix binary load lifters, which actually was the first gig C-3PO mentions having in A New Hope. Vaporators? Sir, my first job was programming binary load lifters, very similar to your vaporators in most 
in the next episode when they pass the Republic fleet, Anakin senses Ahsoka. He's with Admiral Yularen here, who's aged up to bring him closer to his appearance in A New Hope. Anakin sensing her parallels a similar moment when he will sense his son in Return of the Jedi. They head to the Spice Mines of Kessel, which also showed up in Solo, Star Wars Story. And they end up dumping their shipments, as Han Solo claims to have done when he makes excuses to Greedo. Even I get boarded sometimes. Do you think I had a choice? And in this episode, she says, I'm taking us to Fortune and Glory. Which is a nod to Harrison Ford's other scoundrel character. Fortune and Glory, kid. Fortune and Glory. Now, the sisters reveal their family died during the past pursuit of Zero the Hut, And Rafa alludes to Luminara Unduli, the Jedi whom Ahsoka was close with and whose Padawan led to the wrongful accusation that resulted in Ahsoka leaving the Order. Bo-Katan returns, the Mandalorian and sister to Satine. With her is Ursa Wren, mother to Sabine Wren and Rebels. Now, one theory is that that mysterious female armorer from the Mandalorian could be an older version of Bo-Katan or another from this Night Owls group. The Martezes meet with Toongs, the same race as poor old Ben Quadanaros from Phantom Menace. Their supervisor is a Trandoshan, like Bosk, the bounty hunter, or the bounty hunter to the Mandalorian. Notice when Rafa kicks him, the sound department mixes in a raptor yelp from Jurassic Park. <laughs> The Pikes meet with Maul, who mentions his new crime organization. I am certain Crimson Dawn would love the opportunity to take control of your operation. Aha, uh -huh, this ties together Maul's criminal scheming from the Shadow Collective in the animated series to the name of his operation in the live action Solo. Big of all, this brings us to the amazing final arc. It opens with the Lucasfilm title card and the series title in red, which is how they introduce Maul episodes in the past. We are now right before the events of Revenge of the Sith. We see the Jedi meeting, including Diva Balaba and her apprentice, Caleb Doom, who will later grow up to be Kane and Jarrus in Rebels. Kiati Moody's there along with Plo Koon and Ayla Secure. We find out they've been deployed to Outer Rim planets to meet Grievous' offensive, which is all part of Palpatine's plan to scatter the more experienced Jedi away from the core planets in order to leave the Jedi Temple less defended. Clever. And again, it tricks the droids with a fake surrender. And notice the tense music. It's similar to the music when his son, Luke, will trick Jabba with a fake surrender in Return of the Jedi. So, it is with these thoughts in mind that I gladly surrender myself to the, uh, of the Separatist forces. Obi-Wan's now got a few more gray hairs, as he does in Revenge of the Sith, and he saves Commander Cody's life, which, you know, hurts, knowing that Cody will betray him soon after this. And also, uh, yeah, obligated to point out the Akbar reference here. It's a trap, you fools. They learn of a call from Anakin's Fulcrum subspace frequency, which they first think is Saw Gerrera, our old buddy from Alderaan system, who, yeah, appears in Rogue One. But it is actually Ahsoka, which confirms to us that her later Fulcrum spy code name in Rebels, which is also used by characters like Cassian Andor, was a name inspired by her friendship with Anakin. Ahsoka walks off the transport ramp and the Force theme plays. Bo-Katan asks for help to retake Mandalore from Maul, bringing up Obi-Wan's past relationship with her sister Satine. My sister. I thought she meant something to you. But I cannot allow my feelings to cloud my judgment. Cut to Anakin, who absolutely lets his romantic feelings cloud his judgment. Kind of his whole thing. Anakin tells Ahsoka, Loyalty means everything to the clones. Does it? Well, technically, yes, since it's their programmed loyalty to the Republic and Palpatine that cuts through their emotional ties to Ahsoka and the other Jedi. Rex shows how the members of the 501st have painted their helmets to look like Ahsoka, which I know, I'm sorry, it's just a weird thing to do. Oh, look, boss, your face is on my face. But yes, of course, it sets up the series' amazing final shot, so I gotta give it some love. Look, before we keep going, we've been working real hard to keep breaking this stuff down, but full disclosure, guys, it's been tough. New Rockstars was already a skeleton crew of five, and now we're afraid to say the word skeleton. You might not know this, but during this crisis, this platform has been additionally penalizing creators, stiffing hard-earned views with pennies on the dollar of ad revenue. We're fighting to stay afloat however we can. We've been trying small business government loans, but they've been endlessly delayed, it seems. So our last hope has been to partner with other small businesses who are just trying to help us all get through this too. One thing I have been needing help with is finding freaking hand sanitizer. These insane markups by online retailers? It's super frustrating. Thankfully, we were able to partner with another small business called Sanitize and Chill. Sanitize and Chill combines hospital-grade ethanol-based hand sanitizer with CBD. 
CBD, which has been great helping me with things like my inflammation. Now, no worries, we have been checking up on this ourselves because we did not want to get behind any product that wasn't gonna be actually effective at killing viruses. And we have had third-party medical professionals weigh in. We were able to meet the highest levels of guidelines. So this is it. There is no THC in this stuff, so you're not gonna get high, but your hands will get clean, which is what we need. The green color is because there's actually a lot of aloe vera in this stuff. It helps keep your hands smooth. Each bottle has 100 milligrams of CBD, and the alcohol content of the sanitizer is above the 60% level that the CDC recommends for inactivating the viruses that we're all worried about. This says 70% alcohol. It's stronger than those brands that we took for granted that are no longer on the shelves. Now, there is a limited supply of 2,500 bottles because of the small size of the company and the quality of the product. So go check it out. If you can, go for the multi-bottle bundle packs because they're seriously discounted. So if you're looking for a hand sanitizer and if you want to help us out, act now. Go to bit.ly.com slash nrchill and use the code NEWROCKSTARS10 at checkout for 10% off your order. And again, folks, this is just New Rockstars doing our best to stay afloat during these troubled times. So if you're interested in doing this, thank you for the help so much. Obi-Wan informs them that the Battle of Coruscant has begun. What about the Chancellor? The shock T has been sent to protect him, but Master Windu has lost contact with her. This is a nod to the deleted scene from Revenge of the Sith in which Grievous kills the Jedi Shock T. They decide to split the 501st with Rex commanding the new unit, the 332nd, explaining how the 501st ended up with Anakin when he led them into the Jedi Temple. Kill that little kid. Anakin gives Ahsoka two lightsabers, and they see each other's flesh faces for the last time. Yeah, you can definitely see the dread in Ahsoka's eyes. It's almost as if she knows the next time they see each other will be when he's Vader in Rebels. They descend into Mandalore. Race you to the surface! Ahsoka is echoing Anakin from their very first mission. Race you to the top. I'll give you a head start. And the music that plays during the sequence is the same as the opening music in Revenge of the Sith, as Anakin engages in a parallel crash landing, which is occurring concurrently with this one. It's almost as if the two are on the same mission. Their souls are. Following episode, episode 10, The Phantom Apprentice is the season's best. Its title refers to Maul's reveal to Ahsoka that Anakin is the future apprentice to the titular Phantom Menace of Palpatine, Sidious. He has long been groomed for his role as my master's new apprentice. Obi-Wan says he's on his way to Utapau and tells Ahsoka that Anakin is now spying on Palpatine for the Jedi Council. Observe. You mean spy. And the music, again, is the Emperor's theme. And based on the timeline, we are now about halfway through Revenge of the Sith after Obi-Wan and Anakin have parted as friends. Almec dies, revealing who Maul really wanted here. The sky Uka. Hey, just like Yoda's final words. Also, the music that plays are the high octave notes from the Imperial March, the same instrumentation that played over Vader's dying breaths in Return of the Jedi. Maul meets with reps from the syndicate to go into hiding, including the Pikes, Black Sun, and this dude, which I think we can assume is Dryden Voss from Solo, Maul's Crimson Dawn lieutenant. Maul rallies his troopers. You once liberated me from my imprisonment by Sidious. It is not the way of your people to hide here in the gutters. Well, living underground in gutters will be the way for future Mandalorians. Of course, this group customized their armor to reflect Maul's appearance. And this is the group that actually saved Maul in the Son of Dathomir comic storyline, which you should read because it bridges the gap between Maul's capture by Sidious in season five and his return here. Maul also customized the throne room with red and black banners, and he lifts and chokes Bo-Katan in the same place and manner that he did to her sister Satine. So cruel. Maul tells Ahsoka that Sidious is behind this whole plot. He is behind everything in the shadows always mirroring Leia's later words about Sidious in the rise of Skywalker so Palpatine's been out there all this time pulling the strings always in the shadows from the very beginning Maul gives Ahsoka the same join me spiel that Vader gives Luke and Kylo gives Rey everyone does this and of course it turns into a thrilling duel with the fight choreography animated from motion capture by Laura Mary Kim and original Darth Maul actor himself, Ray Park. The reason why this fight is so fluid is because Ray Park moves so fast that the animators had trouble keeping up with him. He ignites his dual wield saber the same way as he did in The Phantom Menace. So sick. And he also later elbows Ahsoka to the face, just like he did to Qui-Gon before he gave his killing blow. And yeah, the music of this fight incorporates choir chanting, just like the John Williams Duel of the Fates. Maul's final rant is chilling. We're all going to burn! We're all going to die! 
That burning includes Anakin, left burnt and scarred by the fateful duel that he will wage shortly after this in the timeline. And the next episode opens by restaging the Jedi Conference from Revenge of the Sith, showing how Rex and Ahsoka were actually part of it. I sense a plot to destroy the Jedi. Great care we must take. I sense a plot to destroy the Jedi. Mm -hmm. Great care we must take. I gotta give some love to composer Kevin Kiner in these final episodes. He did some amazing work. These haunting Sith tones evoke Vangelis' famous score from Blade Runner. Maul's Hannibal-style confinement is a Mandalorian relic from their past wars with the Jedi. On it is engraved an ancient Mandalorian saber wielder, who I'm thinking could be Tara Vizsla, the Mandalorian Jedi who forged and wielded the dark saber. Ahsoka tells Rex, We were trained to be keepers of the peace, not soldiers. This same line was spoken by Mace Windu in Attack of the Clones. We're keepers of the peace, not soldiers. And yeah, it's a good point. Why are these people fighting in wars? It's a big mistake. Maul and Ahsoka hear voices ringing out in terror from Anakin's betrayal of Windu. Don't listen to him, Anakin! Not the Jedi way. He must lead his protectors. Please, no. Right? Yeah, this audio was resampled from Revenge of the Sith, except Anakin's What Have I Done? Which was re-recorded by the Clone Wars Anakin voice, Matt Lanter. What have I done? Sidious gives Order 66 to Rex. Notice his eyes dilate, signaling this order, hijacking his mind. But Rex trembles as he tries to resist it. Find him. Find him. Fives. Find him! Find! <laughs> The music playing here is Anakin's Dark Deeds, which played over Anakin's massacre, killing that kid. Fives was Rex's bud who died after discovering the inhibitor chip conspiracy. That moment was the seed that later allows Rex to momentarily resist here. Ahsoka boots up a few astromechs, including R7 and a new one, CH33P, voiced by Dave Filoni himself. The screen shows Tiplar, whose death by Tup led to Fives investigating the inhibitor chips. Try Anakin's passcode. 8108. The passcode could be a nod to Clone Wars premiere year, 2008, and Hayden Christensen's birth year, 81. Maul marches down the hallway, similar to Vader's death march in Rogue One. He smashes one of the ceiling, pulls their blasters out of their hands, he forces them to flee behind blast doors. Meanwhile, Ahsoka locates Rex's chip with a familiar chant. I am one with the Force, and the Force is with me. I am one with the Force, and the Force is with me. Yes, this is the old mantra of Chirrut Imwe in Rogue One. I'm one with the Force, the Force is with me. Chirrut was not a Jedi, but a more devout Force practitioner like Ahsoka, who no longer aligns with the Jedi Order, but still connects with the spirituality of the Force. Rex confirms the dark truth. The entire Grand Army of the Republic has been ordered to hunt down and destroy the Jedi Knights. Like that nod to Obi-Wan with the voices crying out in terror line, here's another nod to the old man who described this tragic history to Luke. The Empire hunt down and destroy the Jedi Knights. The final episode is titled Victory and Death, a nod to the chant of Maul's followers in the Son of Death Amir comic. Indeed, Maul is a victor who manages to escape this mess. Well, uh, Ahsoka kind of is too, but I don't think she feels too victorious. Ahsoka and Rex set their blasters to stun. This final season uses stun in a few times, actually. It's a throwback to the stun used on Leia in A New Hope, and rarely ever after. Rex and Ahsoka get through it with the classic Star Wars, I got me a prisoner move. The problem is, Ahsoka Tano is no longer a Jedi hasn't been for some time. This has been the justification for how Ahsoka survived Order 66 and semantically how she's still alive to the upcoming season of The Mandalorian, despite Yoda telling Luke in Return of the Jedi, The last of the Jedi will you be. Ahsoka tries to keep Maul from escaping, similar to Rey restraining a departing craft in The Rise of Skywalker, but Ahsoka lets Maul escape to save her friend. She does the right thing, because unlike Rey, she's not the product of pal or his clone spawn. I honestly don't care. Actually, the ship that Maul escapes in is the same model of the ship that we first saw Ahsoka arrive in in the Clone Wars movie. So many memories. The final six minutes of the series are dialogue free, just pure, beautiful visual storytelling. Ahsoka and Rex bury the clone troopers who just tried to kill them, both the 332nd and others. It doesn't matter because, as the series has shown us, all clone troopers have an inner humanity. Their graves with their helmets is a heartbreaking reflection of these stormtrooper heads on Tatooine in The Mandalorian. And we settle on Jesse's helmet, emblazoned with the Republic crest, symbolizing the death of the Republic that they once served, to the end, forever loyal, even when it betrayed them to pave way for the rise of the Empire. Ahsoka drops a saber, and we dissolve to sometime months or years later, when the saber is recovered by the friend who gave it to her. 
who now must assume she's among these fallen, the last piece of his soul ripped away from him. Which gives so much more meaning to his later discovery of her in Rebels. The apprentice lives. As we learn in The Force Awakens, lightsabers sometimes contain memories of their past wielders. So by wielding it here, igniting himself in the blue glow, Anakin is trying to connect with Ahsoka, a hint that goodness in him may live on. Through his eyepiece, you can actually see something we've never been able to see through Vader's mask. The eye of the man underneath, above a condor bird flies, is most likely Morai, the spirit animal bird that Ahsoka revealed in Rebels, a piece of the Force deity, the daughter, when her spirit was channeled into Ahsoka. What Vader takes away from this, who knows? All we know is he simply turns and leaves. He shrinks in the eyepiece of the Ahsoka helmet, linking the three forces of the series in one image, the face of Ahsoka, Anakin, and the troopers who fought alongside them. I like to think this shot is thematically parallel to the final shot of The Phantom Apprentice. This is all about Ahsoka peering out from a divide, just trying to connect with her friend. But she knows deep down that that friend is gone. He's left her alone in the cold. Kudos to Dave Filoni and the whole team. I can't wait to see where they go next with Ahsoka in The Mandalorian Season 2. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss, follow New Rockstars, and subscribe to this channel for breakdowns of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.